What's up, Garistas, Paisans, and all other right people, and welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, the podcast that wastes hours of your life that you will never get back. Uh, I am your one and only, uh, I guess, host today, or I guess Sam is my co-host today because we we got her here. Uh, Gabe was supposed to be here with us. But uh, yeah, he's having some internet issues. So we had him on speakerphone a few minutes ago, and I might patch him in to the podcast later on so you can get his general thoughts on The Lies of Locke Lamora, the masterpiece that is Scott Lynch's debut novel, or at least was back in you know 2006 <laughs> or whatever. Um, but yeah, we're joined by Sam, who you may recognize uh, from many of our episodes. She's been on so many of our episodes at this point, um, including a particularly boozy fourth wing discussion recently. That was very fun. I'll have that tagged up in the annotations up there. If, uh, if you want to check that out, that was a great time. We were just talking about that backstage. (laughs) I was very glad I forced you and Gabe into that. (laughs) It was so much fun. I'm, I'm so excited to, uh, I'm excited to read, iron flame not because i'm like excited to read the book but because i'm excited to like discuss it with you guys yeah Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. i will eat more beforehand next (laughs) for sure yeah Yeah, we got we got a little too a little too boozy last time a little too much fun you know it happens it happens especially when Uh, you're in just such fun company you know right yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) But today for Lies of Locke Lamora, uh, we will be going into spoilers for it. We won't be spoiling um, the rest of the series, but we will be spoiling The Lies of Locke Lamora, the first book. Uh, So if you haven't read it, don't worry. We will also be doing, from what I understand so far, we'll also be doing the next two books in the following weeks. So you can join us as we kind of go through this series, and you can read up and join us for those as well. Also, I'll just let our viewers know ahead of time, we never really shy away from swearing on the podcast, but this is Lies of Locke Lamora, so there's going to be a lot of swearing in this particular episode, as we'll probably be quoting the book quite a bit. So just a heads up if you're particularly sensitive to that kind of thing, because there will be a lot of it. Uh, But before we get started talking about that, A quick reminder that you can reach out to us on Twitter and Discord if you'd like to just reach out and say hi or request anything, or you can even, you know, comment down below here on YouTube to chat with us. I try to get to all of those comments. Uh, You can also support us on Patreon where you can get exclusive content and you can also see these episodes live as we record them. Just for this episode, there's 30 extra minutes of content beforehand of Sam and I just hanging out and talking. So if that sounds like your kind of thing, then join us on Patreon and you get all that. If you're nosy, you can get all this. Yeah, if you want all the the hot goss, you can can go there and, and get it. (laughs) <laughs> we love um, gossip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have a bingo card that is linked down in the description and there's instructions down there that tell you exactly how that works it's like a video you just watch it and it'll it'll show you how to use the bingo card basically you watch our episodes from 2024 and you kind of you know, play bingo. And if you spell bingo, then we will straight up buy you a hardcover trilogy of your choosing. So don't miss out on that. That's for all the episodes in 2024. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been fun making that bingo card. But with all that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about what we've been reading lately. Uh, Sam, have you read anything other than Lies of Locke Lamora between Fourth Wing and this? Um, last time we talked, I had read A Little Lies already, and I think I brought that up last time. I don't know that I read anything else brand new in the meantime. I actually don't think I did. And Lies of Locke Lamora took me so long to get into, unfortunately. Mm. Like, my own fall. It took me, like, a hundred-ish pages to get into, and it took me a good week to get past those hundred pages. Um, So this book is taking up a lot of my time. Worth it in the end, but uh, I don't think I've really read anything else between last time we talked and now. 
Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think the last thing, uh, or really the only thing that I've read between then and now, was the final book in the Powder Mage trilogy, and I thought it was okay. I I thought that it was not as fast paced and action packed as the second book in that trilogy because mm-hmm. I I came out of that second book being like, this is the greatest series ever. Was like, that the this... Gunslinger one? Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, and they can, like, curve bullets Mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. Um, And I was like, dude, this is just the coolest thing ever. And not only the magic, but, like, the characters. Like, I just fell in love with the characters. Mm -hmm. But in the third book, my favorite character was absent for 90% of it because she was, like, kidnapped. And you just don't see her for, like, almost the entire book until the very end and even then you get like one scene with her and it's kind of like and then it's the end of the trilogy and i'm like that was a huge misstep like that character i would imagine that that character is like a massive fan favorite like i i I don't see any world in which this character isn't beloved by all everybody that reads the books um and so i'm like it was just a really weird decision just to not have that character in the book at all Mm -hmm. Um, and even even if the author did want her to get kidnapped it's like show her pov yeah like show like show what she's doing in that time and there was just nothing there was nothing regarding her and so that was a huge misstep and i think a lot of the book was kind of slower in pace and kind of like it was like going around and like tying up loose ends and it didn't really feel like this big epic conclusion like the second Mm -hmm. book felt like the big epic conclusion and the third Mm -hmm. book was just kind of like after everything is done just going around and kind of tying up loose ends and i i didn't really appreciate it as much as i appreciated the first and and second book it was still good it's still better than a lot of books i've read um but it just wasn't it, it didn't live up to the hype of of the first two books and the more time i've gotten away from it the more i've kind of like cemented myself yeah in in feeling that way i think i've had a series like that where uh, what was it called time of legends it's a warhammer book Mm -hmm. and it's like about these elves in this world and you know yada 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 and then i'll never forget the final book coming out and i was so excited for it and all it did was recap everything that had already happened with very few new little things um put into it and like while i enjoyed it i was like this was not like, why put this out? You know what I right. mean? Like, this, this to me was just like, eh, okay. Like, yeah, I read it. Like, I wanted the ending. Um, but I was sort of disappointed in the end. Because I was like, it just felt like a rehashing of everything else. And I didn't get what I wanted out right. of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I was... So there is there is a second trilogy. And literally everyone all across the board has told me that they possibly enjoyed the second trilogy more than the first oh and interesting. It, it, okay and i've had it confirmed uh nobody really spoiled me but somebody did confirm that my two favorite characters from this trilogy are a pov in that one. Oh, good and so i'm like okay that's cool so i'm i'm gonna check that out and hopefully it kind of um raises my spirits on on that yeah. series a bit um because yeah there's so many cool characters there's so many like little world building details that are so interesting and mm-hmm. uh yeah i'm i i am still excited for the for the second trilogy for sure yeah yeah <laughs> so going into spoilers for this book what I'm really curious to hear what your general thoughts are on Lies of Locke Lamora, because I genuinely have no idea. You, you've you told us in the text messages that you want to read the next two books, but I still don't feel like I have a good grasp of if you loved it or if you like hated it or felt okay about it. So okay. I'm really interested. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the things I've realized that is in a lot of books that I've read that have a lot of anxiety inducing plot points <laughs> for myself personally. Yeah. I enjoy them much more the second read than I do mm. the first because 
The second time, I'm not anxious about what's going to happen. I can like <laughs> really delve into the details and just relax because I know what the outcome is. This book Did is crammed this book? with them. <laughs> yeah, loved this book. Loved it. Oh, nice. But I think I would enjoy it much more on my second read because yeah. The amount of times I had to put the book down because I was like, Ugh. yeah, you know, like, oh my god, how are they going to get out of this? How are they going to do this? Blah 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 blah. Um, this book probably more than any book I've ever read before. Yes, I needed tons of like breaks to just like calm myself down. <laughs> right. Yeah. This this book is a constant anxiety attack. Like yes. this book. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, but I think I would enjoy it much more on the second read. But like yeah. I, I'm ready to jump into the next book. Absolutely. Right. There's, I, I, there's a few plot points that I really need some answers on or I'm going to lose my effing mind. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I... Who text you guys about? <laughs> right, for sure, yeah. Yeah, I think that I for sure enjoyed this book significantly more on a second read. Like, I think I read it the first time and I was like, that was great. And then I read it, because I've read this book like four or five times now. Yeah. And... I read it the first time and I was like, that was great. And then the second time I read it, I was like, oh my God, this is a masterpiece. Like this is literally like I, I put this up there in the same vein as like Patrick Rothfuss's I was like, going to say the name of the wind. I was yeah. thinking the name of the wind. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like I, I definitely put it in that same arena. I put it um, probably close to the same arena as like, uh, something like Game of Thrones, or like it's mm -hmm. like it's up there We're in like the, the pantheon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what uh, I was thinking too. <laughs> I I love this so much, and it's like um, you know wh when we were talking about Fourth Wing, and, and we were talking about it before the show too. I said that basically, like I I enjoyed this book, but I recognized that it wasn't like written well, <laughs> like objectively. Yeah. This yeah. book. I look at it and I'm like, okay, like this, this book objectively, like if I just like stood back and looked at it, like, yes, I love it. Like, yes, this does everything I want from a book, but objectively stepping back and looking at it, it is a masterpiece. Like the way that he crafts his sentences and the way that he makes all of the the plots like interweave perfectly and come together and just land at such a emotional he, conclusion he tells the story like timeline wise yes um i think because we've talked about this before where i'm like the first time i read something i have to physically read it or i mm. cannot like it just doesn't compute it doesn't process um and i think this book would have been a little hard audio the first time as well because it jumps around so much in the timeline you know which right. i have no problem with that when it comes to telling a story because I think that shows like the highest marks of an author where they're able to yeah. be like, okay, here's a story from A to Z, but I'm going to tell you in this like really weird order to make it the most impactful for you. Right. Um, and I thought he was a phenomenal storyteller in the way that he chose to dole out the pieces of information um, that he did. I, yeah. I really enjoyed that. And I thought it was, it was masterful. Like anybody could tell a story from point A to point Z. Mm -hmm. But it takes a real author to be like, what's the best way I can tell the A to Z plot points, you know? Yeah, because I think I think this book would have gotten really boring if he had started with the story of Locke as a kid and just continued to yep. like age him up to where we get to the end mm -hmm. of the Salvara game. And as and... an author to know like how how I can tell this story in a way that captivates you, you know, like yeah. that's a true mark of just like I, professionalism. It, it was, it was great. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think that he used the timelines to his best advantage where, you know, we, we read uh, Empire of the Vampire and Empire of the Damned recently, and those have two different timelines going mm -hmm. on. But I never really felt, besides maybe a couple times, I never really felt like the timelines 
told us something that we needed to know for the next chapter in the in the next timeline um maybe they did and i just didn't catch it but i never really felt like oh like this is that thing from the previous timeline like i never had like that mind-blowing moment Mm -hmm. um but in this one the timelines are specifically used to tell you something that you need to know for the future timeline it may not be in the next chapter it may not be in the next three chapters but by the end of the book there will be something from one of the previous timeline chapters that tell you something you need to know for the future one um yeah it was very um i was actually going to say empire of the vampire as well or you know empire of the damned um where you don't want to you want to stay in the story that you're in Mm -hmm. but then within a couple sentences they've pulled you into this next chapter and by the end you're like no wait i don't want this to end i don't want to go back to what i was dying for you know before and i thought he was masterful with these books where i would get a couple sentences and be like no i just want to go back to what we were just reading about and then i was like by the end like no, no, i'm so captivated by this (laughs) yeah (laughs) i was like okay i get like what your point of telling me this was and there was no fluff right yeah Bullshit that we didn't need and like i'll never forget when i was really getting into like the thick of it being like oh my god like so <laughs> i read how many pages did i read today i had 300 pages to finish today when i no up. what you put so, it off that long <laughs> no the first 150 pages took me about a week and a half to get through like oh i just god. i was so anxious about the don salvara <laughs> thing that I it was all I could focus on and then once I really I would say probably close to like 200 pages in is where it really just like snatched me and I was like okay even though I'm anxious like I need to know more like I need to keep going do you remember Um, what was happening in the story at that point I read about 500 to 600 of the pages in the last two days (laughs) It's How all many pages I did yesterday. Is it? It's like, all what I did copy since I got up at six thirty this morning. <laughs> how many? How many pages is your copy? Is it like a seven fifteen? Oh shit! You're right. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So I just. I have... was only at about two hundred this morning. Jeez. I mean, I'm sorry. Yesterday, yesterday I was about two hundred. Today, oh, okay. I was at. I had to read three hundred pages. It was. It was three hundred really pages today. Today I read. I read all. It's all I did from when I got up at six thirty a.m. Oh my god! I, went I out, had no I got idea. My from Duncan, I came home and I sat on my couch and that's all I did. And it was phenomenal. It put me <laughs> in. I didn't want to do anything else. It was great. But this book was a slow burn for me. Mm. Like to captivate me enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in the end, I'm I'm so grateful. I loved it, but it, it took a while for me to get into it. Yeah, for sure. I think it, it did for me the first time too. It, it definitely took a while for it to like grasp me. But mm-hmm. now, when you go back and reread, mm-hmm. you'll just want to sit in every chapter yeah. just forever because well, this time I just wanted to speed through it because I was like, I want to know right. the outcome. <laughs> right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What what copy do you have? Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, I have I have that one, and then I have the the Golan Z cover that's behind us in the background here up in. Is Stream that how Yard. you say it? I've said Golan-Z. it so differently in my head. What do you say? Galans, I think. Oh yeah, I think that's probably a fair a fair way to do it too. I don't Just know. Just like with this I don't book, know. where I am going to say Gene and Spencer <laughs> was not going to say Gene. <laughs> no, yeah, I was telling Sam before the show that. Uh, in getting ready for this podcast, I had listened to some people's like YouTube videos and some podcasts on it. And these people who haven't done the audio book were saying, Gene, I'm like, you shut your fucking mouth. <laughs> like it's John. <laughs> John. I'm sorry, but first of all, fantasy is notorious for like always having. Sure. I love those like reels or TikToks or whatever where people are like reading a book out loud and they get to the name like you know like they just make fun of how in fantasy novels they're just like ridiculous names sure yeah (laughs) (laughs) but yeah Um, but yeah so I've always be Gene to me always be Gene to you (laughs) that's so funny 
um, but yeah, I have I have the version that you see on the on the background behind us, and then I also have this really cool one, and I'm not sure exactly when this is or when it was when this was printed. I kind of wonder if it's like the first one. You have a first edition? No, not like a first edition, but like the first cover. Yeah, I think this is the first cover they did because it's a 2006 edition. That's so pretty. Why would they have ever changed that? And it's Locke looking up at the glass towers. That's so pretty. Yeah. I found Why it in a... Why would they have changed it from what you have to what I have? Mm, I don't I don't know the one you have I'm not sure when that edition was released um, but I know the one that's like behind us now on StreamYard is definitely the one that uh, is usually sold now like it that's now the cover um, I can grab my version this Let's... is 2013 mine was published my version was published from Delray Mine's only like 10 years old. Yeah, this one. See, you have really pretty covers. Mine's like really boring. <laughs> and yeah, you were looking I've... at a new one online I saw before we got on our stream. Yeah, I, I try to get every edition. I need the 10th anniversary edition and then Broken Binding just put out some new editions, but it's only if you're subscribed to their service and you have to be on like a wait list in order to subscribe. So I'm like, damn it. Heavy so I'll, I'll, roll. I'll buy it for like 200 bucks a book when they finally, somebody sells them. I don't think I there's guess. any book I want that much. That, <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> that one, when you already own a copy of it. Uh, yeah. That, I'm not a big special edition person. I'm really not. That that thread light that's up on the shelf is yeah. like $150. Yeah, so why would you pay more for a book? <laughs> 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 I don't know. I like I like having the special edition. It looks cool I on the mean, shelf. It's fun to show people. I like to physically own my books, but I don't <laughs> care about like I have a ton of books that like I will have multiple copies of books if I buy it when it first comes out and it's hardcover. And with my hands, if I really love a book, I buy the paperback because like it's just mm. easier for me to read. Yeah. Um, but that's about the extent. Do you not do <laughs> ebook? I I have quite a few books where I own the physical, I own the ebook, I own the audio book because depending on how into a book I was or how much I loved it, I may then purchase the audio after to be able to like re-listen to it. Yes. So let's let's talk about audio because you are missing out so hard by not doing the audio for this book. Makes sense. I, second time around. <laughs> I know, I know. But I'm just like, as I'm listening to the audio this time, I'm like, Sam is missing like one of the best performances I've ever heard. I'm going to share my, I, I brought up a little piece of audio just to show you. Um, Please, because like, I don't know if I trust you. You liked the audio for uh, Fourth Wing, so... <laughs> dented metal I can't sell to anyone with any class ever again. You breakers yeah. and second story boys think you're so clever. You'd steal shit from a dog's asshole if you had the right sort of bag to bring it home with you. Funny you should say that, Harza, because this bag here, Locke plucked the burlap sack from Bug's hands and held it up, happens to contain something other than dog shit. <laughs> I can hear it jingling. Give over and let's see if you accidentally brought in anything worth buying. <laughs> But his voice is locked to me. Almost sounds like a little too old. Do you know what I mean? No, it's it 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 might at first just from like that sample, but the character that he was doing was like an old guy. But uh, oh, I thought it was Chains. No, 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 no. Chains has like a gruff, like deep, deep gruff voice. Um, and then Locke's voice is just so perfect. It's like exactly how I picture. Lock. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just like a tiny bit whiny, just like a tiny bit like aristocratic a little bit, but like whiny just a yeah. tad. And it's so it's so good. I love these audiobooks. And there's moments where like at the end, uh when he is stabbing the Grey King and he's like, and this one's for Bug, my you I know, love those my parts. friend, <laughs> my my brother and my friend. And you can just hear the tears rolling down this narrator's voice like it sounds like he's crying mm -hmm. while he's saying this and it's just like it's just the 
one of the very best performances yeah. I've ever well, heard. I just got my Audible credit, so it'll be yeah. my next one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's it's amazing. I cannot recommend these audiobooks specifically enough. So going through some other general thoughts, let's look at some of the themes of of this book. Because I thought, you know, knowing what happens in the next one, and I won't spoil anything, Please but... Don't. Of course not. But like the the first book has a lot of themes of, you know, you're you're looking at this boy who is coming into this thieving crew with all of the confidence of this, you know, just hot to trot, like like I know what I'm doing, like I'm the best thief, whatever. And he's coming into this crew with all of that. And he gets taken down a peg over and over and over, especially when John comes on and he like knocks his lights out and, you know, Locke is like, oh, maybe I need to learn how to defend myself and kind of looks at those kind of things. And so as I was reading this this time, I'm like, this book has themes of overconfidence and learning from your mistakes, because I think Locke does that a lot in the younger timeline <clears throat> he's like trying to learn from his mistakes and make himself better and better and better and then even in the future timeline he has that moment where he realizes you know people asked him like should i should we just give up the salvara game like should we just cut our losses and run and Locke is like no we have him right where we want him like it'll be great and then everything goes to shit and it's kind of this big moment for Locke where he realizes like why did I let my my ego and my ambition and everything get before protecting my friends and so I think there's a big a big theme theme of that um, and then paying consequences and and revenge like we see mm -hmm. we see Locke have to pay for a lot of the the consequences especially going into into book two we'll see more of that and you see the revenge with both Locke and the Grey King. <clears throat> like the Grey King's whole plan this whole time is revenge. Like he wants mm -hmm. to get revenge on the city of Kamor, not mm -hmm. just Kappa Barsavi, but also all of Kamor. He wants revenge on the entire nobility. And then you have Locke <clears throat> who actually succeeds in his revenge. Uh, well, I guess the, the Grey King did too, to some extent, but Locke, who is wronged by the Grey King and taking his revenge for his friends that, that have died. Um, and so I think there's big themes of that, like looking at looking at the Grey King as a person and looking Locke looking at Locke as a person where the Grey King is in it for uh, just throughout like his whole scope of his mission. He is in it for revenge and power and to obtain more influence. And Locke, like, yes, he loves to steal. Like, he loves to just, like, get money and just have it pile up, and that's his whole thing. But he also has a deep love for his friends. And at the end of the day, um, they typically will come before any of his his other plans uh he will typically look out for uh jean's safety and and bug's safety before he will you know do anything else mm -hmm. and so i think there's a big difference between the two and i like how it kind of compares the two because they're very they're very like opposite yet yet similar like they're in the same kind of like criminal world but they're they're opposite sides of the coin to Two each sides, other yeah the same coin right um and then i would say you know going in going into the second book i would say like this book started the themes of like friendship and trust and the second book is like all of that so it's like this the the major themes of the second book are like friendship and trust um and learning who you can trust and and who you can't um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, a theme that, like, I was very aware of through all of it is hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm, and yeah. will you be the one to stop the cycle or, cycle or will you perpetuate it? And right. the whole time, you know, Locke gets some of his revenges. I'm like, okay, but how is this not going to stop, like, 
a new hatred of someone being their mortal enemy being started. Like, how many lives did you touch? Right. To get your mission that you wanted done, which I found really interesting. But um, I think the Don Salvara thing mm -hmm. until the end, which is again why I'm like, I think I would love this on a reread. But the first yeah. time around, I'm like, what the? How many signs do you need to stop something? How greedy are you? Like, yeah. Are you really willing to risk it all for maybe like a couple thousand more crowns? Like yeah. that was a really big problem for me during it where it was just like, okay, is this your pride speaking or is this like your level headed brain being like, no, 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 we can definitely get away with this. Yeah, so it's it's definitely Locke's pride. Um, and it's also, you know, he, he briefly talks about it, how before the Don Salvara game, there were three other noble families uh -huh. that they did this to. Mm -hmm. And they pushed those to its limits. Like, they just completely ruined them to the point where they, like, don't want to tell anybody because they're super embarrassed. And so I think that has built up the confidence of the gentleman bastards. And, like, their motto we see it in in flashbacks and whatnot their their motto as a crew is that they are cleverer and better than everybody else like that's their whole belief system and so of course they think that they can just keep going with the don salvara game and that nothing mm -hmm. bad will happen um and like oh we've outwitted them by pretending to be the midnighters and like coming yeah. in and you know giving them like some information like this guy is trying to rob you but you need to keep doing it and so they're like yeah we got him right where we want him little do they know that the um the lady what was her name sophia mm -hmm. she knows donya Vercen vercenzia i forget her name the uh the spider. spider yeah and she like went directly to her and she's like can can you check with your midnighters to make sure everything's going on here? L that like that went way over Locke's head. He did not see that coming. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when it all really fell to shit. Uh, otherwise, Locke and Jean and all of them were doing a, a great job. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I thought it was really, you know, amazing how I knew right away when I was reading it that it was really Locke going to them and saying like oh you're being taken but like you need to play along so we could like get him yeah i immediately did know i was like oh this is them i was mm. like this is them securing it for themselves so that like how are you going to you know question this when we're telling you it's a scam and right. that we wanted to keep going so we could capture him i was like oh that's brilliant is I was that like, that's brilliant? really brilliant <laughs> but that was one of the few things i did clock immediately that i was like oh no this is them yeah i was like sure. this is this is not somebody <laughs> yeah <laughs> like ratting them out i was like this is definitely them like securing their bag <laughs> totally for sure that was also the most difficult part of the timeline jumps especially mm -hmm. for an audiobook reader because usually it'll say when it's going back in the timeline it'll say interlude chapter whatever and then yeah. get the name of the chapter this one just fluidly went back and forth between mm -hmm. them there as the midnighters to them just a couple hours prior and getting ready and preparing mm -hmm. to go in as midnighters um that was definitely the most difficult part of the the timeline jumping for a, a first time reader um, I would especially say my most audio. difficult part was the, the Sabatha being, is that how we say it? Sabatha? Sabatha. Sabatha. Kind of like Samantha. <laughs> yeah. Sabatha. Sabatha. <laughs> what is it? Spencer, I need, I need something, Spencer. <laughs> I need something because I talked Spencer and Gabe last night when I was, what, probably like maybe like 400 pages in and I was like, I swear to effing God, if I get through this whole book, and she has mentioned one more fucking time, and we are not given <laughs> any goddamn information on her. How she yeah. became one of them. Why she was sent away the first time. Why she was still away. I was like, I'm going to lose my fucking mind. I'm going to lose my fucking mind because we got none of those goddamn answers. Like, like I understand. I, 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 I get it, but, like, I do have a problem when something in a book is mentioned so many fucking times and we're giving nothing you yeah. gave me nothing <laughs> what the fuck 
Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the... I Is think... it a big enough payoff that, like, it's worth? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I will say it's kind of a running gag that Spencer, the... you tell me I don't find out about this until the third book, I'm going to freaking shoot you. I swear to God. <laughs> Well, yeah, so it's Ugh. it's kind of a it's kind of a it's kind of a running gag that that Lynch has with his audience that I'm like he's like I'm going to give you little breadcrumbs about this person. Yeah. Once you're in on it, I'm sure it's fucking great on a reread. <laughs> when you're not in on it, you're just pissing me off, dude. You're yeah. pissing me off. I I will say that you you will probably like the third book a lot. I'll Can you that. imagine if you read The Name of the Wind and like Denna was just brought up all the fucking time <laughs> for not giving any context on how he knew Denna or why he was so fucking devoted to her or <laughs> And then there's just like no third book, so you never know. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that? I mean I get it, but you're telling me I gotta read a whole nother book, which I'm sure I'll enjoy. And yeah. I still will not get my answer. Fuck you'll off. you'll get some. You'll you'll get some More clues. More than the and... first, I hope, because there was nothing in the first. Yeah, yeah. You'll you'll definitely get some more information, but I think I think you'll be very very happy with the with the third book. I'll, I'll just so say that. One day we may be able to clip this. You know, Spencer. <laughs> he's one of his nights home where he's had a stressful day, as we were talking about earlier, and he's gonna relax by editing some videos, and he's gonna edit <laughs> this clip into our future clips on the book, okay? Where I'm like, what is this bullshit? And I texted you and I said, I go, if this is a girl in the window across the street, whatever that book is, where the whole time, spoiler alert, her husband and daughter are dead, but she's been talking to them and you think they're alive and you find out way later that they're dead. If that is this, I will revolt. I will, <laughs> I will never trust another book that you give me again, Spencer. No, I I don't I don't want to give anything away, but I think I'm, I I I can for I can for sure say that you will probably enjoy the third book the okay. most. Yeah, I love how you said probably prefaced it like just in case. <laughs> just in case, just give myself a little wiggle room. <laughs> That's me. I'll I'll go ninety nine percent on a lot of mm, things, but I will yeah. never go a <laughs> hundred. <laughs> I gotta leave that wiggle room for being wrong. You know, right. just in case. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the the second book is my favorite. I think um okay. The, the if if the first book is like a lot of plot and a lot of like twists and turns and like you're keeping track of all these different like games that Locke has going on, um the second book almost kind of is a middle ground between the first book and the third book because the second book is a lot more character moment focused. Good, good. I and like that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and and you're focusing on um like there's a plot that's going on in the background but it doesn't matter nearly as much as the first book and you're more first focusing book has like 10 plots going on. Yes, exactly. Month. Yeah. The second Ooh. book there's like two and they're hardly even really going they're not like a big plan. They're not like this big like mastermind plan like they're just getting into hijinks and you're just yeah. watching these characters play on this stage that the author has created and you're getting more of those character moments. And then oh, like the that. third like book, that. the third book is almost no plot and just character moments. <laughs> he went like in reverse. Yeah. So it like completely reverses from the first book. So I, I love both of them. Um, I think I definitely... I definitely have some issues with the third book that we can talk about when you get there. Yeah. But the the second book is by far my favorite. It is so much fun. It is yeah. it's amazing. So Okay. I, oh, I'm, I mean, thankfully I already own the whole series. Yeah. I, a plus to, you know, it only adds to me like buying books fully as a series before I read the first book and yeah. then hating the first book and not reading the rest. Um right. but I love the first book, so I'm really glad that I own the rest of them but i i I cannot (laughs) wait i cannot wait to see your just thoughts and musings evolve on this series as you go through it because 
Like they <laughs> they are just so good. Like they are some of like mine and Gabe's yeah. favorite books of all time. So I'm I'm super excited to to well, see. Well, I'm what so you sad Gabe forward. is having his internet issues because he had said last time he spoke that he was like me, where he tried to start it twice before the third time it actually stuck for him. And I was yeah. like, same. <laughs> Yeah, he and I see it now that I've finished it. Like I get it, you know. Like yeah, that was probably one of the books that, like, if I had not like had to read this for the podcast, I don't know that I would have made it through. It was a to me personally, it took me like close to two hundred pages to be like, oh my god, now I yeah, can't stop. yeah, it, it definitely. <laughs> and you know that and that happened to me too. I think like I started mm-hmm. it once and I didn't get past the. um where the fi- where the timeline switches for the first time as an aud- either, yeah. as an audio reader I was like what is going on and I just DNF'd it and then I finally came back it's definitely a very difficult start like it's not it's not an easy book to get into in the beginning <laughs> um but it certainly pays off what what was happening in the story for you when it finally switched where you were like I, I get it now. So I think the problem was for me is the way that it started where you know they're trying to con um, Salvara, right? Yeah. And the way that it was set up made me be like, okay, this is going to fail. So I was going into it reading it like, oh, like they're waiting in the alley and he's got the thing around his neck. But like the way that it had been set up like chapter wise, I was like, okay, they're setting us up to know that it's going to fail. Right. So I was very anxious about the whole Don Salvara thing right from the beginning, like alleyway, when yeah. that was like the most minor part eventually mm-hmm. of the story. But the right. way it was set up was that I was like, oh, are they going to get caught immediately? Like the, the, right. they're going to be caught out for what they're doing immediately. And it took at least 100 pages to be like, oh, no. They, they're just trying to set you up for the long con and yeah. give you backstory. This is not like a, this is where it ends right, right away with them being caught in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and that was hard for me because I'm an anxious reader. And if I'm like worried constantly, like, oh my God, are they going to get caught? Are they going to get caught? I have trouble like getting into the story. Hmm. So it was around... Once he went on the pleasure barge or whatever their yeah. barge was and like went through the whole thing with them and then they faked being the people telling them that they were being conned, that's when I got into it. I was like, oh, they are playing 4D chess. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, they're covering all of their bases. And that's when I was like, okay, maybe you can relax, Sam, and just yeah. like enjoy this and like go along for the ride. That's probably when I really got into it when they revealed that they were the ones who told Don Salvara that he was being caught. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely where it kind of shifted for me too. like one of my favorite scenes from this book is that pleasure barge thing, because what the, what the alley scene does so well is it shows you that these guys are willing to go to pretty extreme lengths to get their, con across and like dressing up like in all this like frilly like coat and everything and uh you know having Calo and galdo like holding a rope to his Mm -hmm. neck and all this stuff and it it shows you how organized and how well they've thought it out and then you get to the pleasure barge where it's not really showing you anymore it's more telling you and the reason that you believe it as a reader is because they showed you earlier. Like they, mm-hmm. they showed you them yeah, like, it's like call actually back. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so on the pleasure barge, when, when the narrator is telling the reader, yeah, like they went out to this other country and they got this cask of like this incredible, uh, what was it? Whiskey Oscar or whatever. Shallon. Brandy. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. And like it mentions like John and Locke like went to this other country and dropped five or 800 Solons for like this special one. I loved those. (laughs) Yeah. And, and at that point it's like, okay, you can just like tell me this stuff now because you showed me earlier. And so I love the way those two scenes kind of work in tandem. And 
I love just like the pleasure barge where you just see Locke in his prime, just like mm-hmm. wheeling and dealing and like telling him like, oh, and like like telling a story basically to these people and like selling himself. And even back in the in the alley scene when he's like, uh, oh, do you know this other Duke? And like knowing that they're enemies and the Salvara is mm-hmm. like, so uh, actually, like, why don't you give me your business instead of going to this other like Don or whatever? Yeah. And I just I love when uh, when Locke is just in that fluid like he's just moving through the conversation with a silver tongue and he's just got like an entire grasp on the situation. I love those mm-hmm. moments so yeah. much. Yeah, it's it was cool to see how he is just able to like play it off the cuff and you know I'm gonna have these set of facts in my head of like you know the persona I'm taking on and the way things should be but like you're able to separate that from your reality and like fully take on this character is just beyond what I could ever do personally (laughs) you know what I mean so like I I always enjoy that when people are just that fucking good right you know it's awesome. It <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and kind of going along with that, what did you think of the, what did you think of like the dialogue and the banter and like the, just like the banter between the gentleman bastards themselves? Like, did you, did you enjoy all the creative dialogue? I did because I felt like it was very true to like, if I had been in that position, that's how I would have said that thing. Um, I have no filter. So if you piss me off, I'm going to fucking tell you. You know what I mean? And I felt like Locke and I really related in that sense where it was like, even if it's to my detriment, I'm still going to tell you to fuck off Mm -hmm. because you should fuck off. Right. (laughs) Like you deserve it. (laughs) Um, And the camaraderie and I don't know, almost every scene pulled me in as if like I could, you know, picture myself there and seeing it as like a real thing that could have happened. Yeah, I love just like the dialogue between all of them and even even just the like the prose. Um it the prose felt really similar to Name of the Wind. It wasn't like overly mm-hmm. flowery, but it was yeah. there were certain sentences where I'm just like, "Wow, that was that was great." Like that was just the way that was mm-hmm. written, the way that was spoken was so it's impactful instead of being like superfluous and just like right. adding something to add something, which is for sure like wheel of time. That's what annoyed me is where I felt like there was just so much dialogue, but there was so little like real information you needed out of what you were yes, spending totally. 30 minutes reading. It would drive me insane. I'd be like, I did not need 30 pages of this conversation in this room with these right. two people. Like I got nothing from this. I felt like everything in Liza Locke Lamora had a purpose right none of it was wasteful everything right. i was reading i needed to pay attention to and that's really hard for an author or yeah. at least for me as a reader to be like wow they really they they got this and i felt like this was one of those books yeah without a doubt without a doubt like everything that was on the page it was there mm-hmm. for a reason even if exactly. it was just like a even if it was just like a side character like um like when they're going to Kappa Barsavi's um, place to like pay their dues, mm-hmm. they're in the boat with that guy and he's just some random side character, but it's telling you something about the world where he's like giving like hand signals to people on the canals yeah. to say like, hey, like you can rob this boat or whatever, like mm-hmm. it's being lightly guarded. And then he tells them that the... Uh, the leader of the full crowns tesso uh was killed by having his balls cut off and he was nailed to a wall and then you find out in the timeline jump later the kids that were attacking young lock and friends um that was him that was tesso that was the leader of that game. yeah yeah that was great <laughs> and so it's like you find out that he dies in modern day by having his balls cut off and it's like wow it just it all connects like it all connects together so okay, well question. Yeah. non-spoiler question will we get more of the bondsmiths bondsmage bondsmage oh yes Sorry. yeah because as i was reading it 
all I could think of was I need like a whole series on the Bonds Mage. <laughs> like their their world. Like, did you get angry as you were reading, as if you were like Lock Lamora and like you never want to say this is unfair because the world's unfair. That's how it is. It, that's the whole point of these books is like yeah. the world is not fair. It's all about using your fucking brains and figuring out like how can I win yeah. with the circumstances I have, you know, or the tools that I have. Um, but I needed to know more. I I because they pissed me off so much that mm-hmm. the way that they could just yeah. destroy anyone at any time and have these superior. It, it's like a doctor fighting a newborn. You know what I mean? It's just not a fair fight in any way. And I was like, see, I need more information on this. Like I want, I want to know a lot more information on this. You, you will definitely get a lot more information on them. Yeah. You'll get, you'll get a bunch more. And I think that's kind of why, like, especially reading this for the first time now on a reread after reading them all, like I understand the bonds mage a lot Mm -hmm. more. But reading it for the first time, I was like, I kind of love this because we're following a normie, like someone who doesn't have magic that exists in this magical world. And the Bond's magic is so scary. Like it is legit terrifying. Mm -hmm. Um, And seen from the eyes of someone who's just a regular guy, it it seems like God powers. Like it is so... And, and I feel like fantasy has a bad tendency to show magic in a way that's like, oh yeah, there are mages. Like they they have magic and they throw it's spells around and like yeah, it just is what it is. <laughs> yeah, and in this one, it's it's actually like, no, if people had magic, they would be fucking scary. Like it would be a horror yeah. show. Yeah. Any so, information on the bonds mages was just like, oh wow, they went in and we're just like, no, like bend the knee. Yeah. Or we will fucking destroy all of your family first in front of you. Yeah. And then we will destroy you. And well, it was like an unfair fight. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, totally. It's fair in a way. Like, it, it is what it is. But yeah. um, it's showing up to a knife of, fight with a cannon. Like, yeah. In the context of, you know, the book that we were reading and what we had learned so far, it was just like, all right, well. Where does this go? I I need more information on this because he took down, sort of, in a way, without them... Okay, question. So, you know, you can't kill a Bonds Mage or they're going to come after you and kill your whole family and then kill you. Right. How does it work when you maim them? (laughs) You'll find out for sure. (laughs) Because to me... (laughs) It felt almost more egregious oh, yeah. than just fucking killing them. I, I so, would say they think so too, yeah. <laughs> okay, because I was just like, I don't think not killing this guy is is doing you any favors right now. I think yeah, he, I don't, he almost did worse. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think by st- sticking to the letter of the law that you're doing yourself any favors any at favors. all. And so. granted, I... I absolutely understand why you did what you did sure. i don't know what else you could have done in that situation to get out of it but damn i i don't think you're free and clear of them coming after you yeah. at all just because you didn't actually kill him yeah for sure yeah big oversight big okay. oversight <laughs> okay. <laughs> i just want to make sure i wasn't like reading this wrong where i'm like no dude sure. you're still fucked <laughs> yeah you're still completely <laughs> you're <fucked>. still fucked <laughs> oh man yeah i can't like, these I... people seemed pretty scary from the little information that you gave me so i don't think they're gonna take this slight kindly because based off of what you've told me any slight is just yeah death worthy like yeah life ending worthy so right. <laughs> yeah imagine like a cat playing with a trapped mouse that's pretty much yes that's but the trapped what... mouse somehow <laughs> kills the cat and then the cat's yeah. family is, or maims the cat and then the cat's family is like i don't care that you didn't kill him you still fucked with us you right. still acted like you had power so guess what now we're really gonna lay down yeah Oh, it's going to be fun. It's going to okay. be fun for sure. Yeah. I, so one thing I wanted to mention about the the banter and stuff is, and this is something that I noticed this time around, especially because I've, I've read a lot of books 
recently that have humor in them, but they feel very um like a lot like cheap humor like it's it's humor that'll make you chuckle or whatever but it's very it's very cheap like it it feels like guardians of the galaxy like it falls into that same trap where like guardians of the galaxy is funny like i will laugh when i watch a guardians of the galaxy movie but it's not like like oh that joke hit me at the core of my funny bone you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i feel like Scott Lynch was able to do something really insane where he's he has a way of doing banter that um, somehow feels like sophisticated but also being this dirty grimy like gallows humor like something about it appears to the you're, you're like wow that is a really dirty and nasty joke but it was incredibly well spoken <laughs> like it was incredibly well like just huh? like I don't know articulated no yeah. I know exactly what you mean because sometimes I like to think of myself <laughs> in that way at some points where it's like don't argue with me because I might insult you and it'll go right over your head mm-hmm. you know what I mean like you're yeah. not even close to my level enough to understand that I'm insulting you right now right and I fucking love that type of humor I yeah. love it <laughs> when they're openly insulting someone to their face and they're too fucking stupid to even understand that they're being insulted right favorite Favorite. favorite type of you know <laughs> humor or dialogue like i really really just am receptive to that type of uh, of writing i just love yeah. it and Locke is the personification of I all know. of it. you know essentially he's like, such he, a wordsmith he really is in a way that you're like oh i wish i was that smart you know or yeah. that quick for you know, sure yeah, he's so he's so just like fast and yeah i i was thinking uh while i was reading it this time i'm like how did scott lynch come up with half this stuff and i was listening to an interview with him that that i would recommend watching after you've read all the books mm-hmm. and um he was basically saying He's like, you know when you're in an argument with somebody and you don't know what to say at the time, but then like three days later, you're like, perfect. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, oh, I wish I had said this. He's like, that's what it's like for me writing. He's like, I'll write a scene and I'll have like some basic banter in there that's just like fill in banter. And then I'll think about that scene while I'm writing the next scene and I'll be like, you know what would have been perfect is this. And he'll go back and write that into it. He's like, that's how I do it. And I'm like, that is such a I smart way to think about it. Yeah. I love that. That's like a day to day thing for me. You know, oh, right. I, I know. You, know <laughs> you can go back and change it. I know. <laughs> the amount of times that I'm just like in the shower and I'm like, fuck, I should have said this. Okay, well, question. <laughs> So you know how there's apparently two type of people in the world? People who have inner monologues, inner dialogues going on at all times, and then people who just like apparently fucking do things without any thought or question. Do you have conversations with yourself in your head? Oh, 100%. There, there's two of Thank me. You. There's two of me. There are two of me. But I will never for, forget when I saw like a TikTok where it was like, there are two people, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I went to my husband and I was like, you talk to yourself, right? Like you talk, you have full on conversations in your head with yourself. And he looked at me like. Like you were crazy. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? What am I talking about? Like, Yeah, because like, otherwise, how do you plan anything? Like, how do you. So apparently people like us who have the inner dialogue cannot comprehend not having it and the people who don't have it are like yeah whatever okay because they don't fucking have that constantly <laughs> going in their head 24 7 but people like us are like i don't understand how you make it through the day right yeah i, I, I don't understand it and yeah. i feel like Locke is a inner dialogue oh yeah for sure he has right? to be he has to be he has to be yeah did you also know that there are people that uh, can't see things in their head? Like they can't like picture things? I can't. You can't? Oh, that's so crazy, so, dude. So here's the thing, right? If, I give, if I'm given a reference, I can then picture that in my head. But on my own, I absolutely cannot conjure anything in my brain. Yeah. And it is 
it makes me so sad. That is so <laughs> wild. I, I just learned about this like a year ago. I and I was like, how do people like not we like don't. picture just... things? Like that is so wild. So like I always reference Game of Thrones. I read those books all through, you know, up until the current one and couldn't picture anything. And then I watched the show over the years. And then when I went on a reread recently, I p can picture all of the people from the show when I'm reading it. Yeah. But I cannot on my own organically come up with they make huh. fun of me at work because I've talked about how I like skim almost descriptive shit because I'm like, I can't picture it, so this is useless details to me. Yeah. Tell me what he tell me he has long brown hair and a scar across his face and dimples and blah 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 blah. Guess what? In two pages I will not remember a single one of those things you told me. Oh. So over time I have kind of just I skim a lot of descriptive, especially when people get to a city for the first time and they go to explain it. And I'm like, I I, I can't picture this. I don't give a fuck what you say. The city looks like like it, it's Dang. a city. Okay, that's all I need to know. So do you? So when you're reading, you don't have any idea in your head of like what the characters look like or anything. Nothing. Nothing. Like, did you do you picture? Here, I'll show you. Uh, it's not a picturing thing. It's more like a I'm there without having to see it. I, I have no visualization in my head of what Locke looks like. Absolutely nothing. So you didn't picture him looking like this? Can you make it bigger? No. Well... Wait, click it. Double click it. No. No idea. I pictured him as like Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Maybe a little bit younger. I tried to think of someone that I thought of already as frail. Yeah. But no, like, Spencer, I cannot, without a reference, like, I was like, all right, let me think of, you know, what's his name from Big Bang Theory? Um, no, I can't on my own. Oh, wait, hang on. There we go. Yeah. I that's... couldn't figure out, like, was he good looking? Was he not? Was he too thin that, like, women were like, you really need to eat, like, a lot of food? Like, you need to gain at least 10 pounds? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I picture him looking like this, but, like, with just slightly longer hair, like, enough to pull back in, like, a ponytail kind of thing. I pictured him thinner. The way okay. that they always talked about how, like, gaunt and gangly and I mean, he's pretty strong. thin there. I, I think. Guess I, I guess I just pictured someone who looked malnourished. And I don't right. think oh, that, okay. I, while that person's thin, I don't think they look malnourished. Sure. And I feel like the book was always trying to make me feel like he was, like, a weakling. Yeah, I mean, he definitely is. Like, he's definitely the weakest of all of them, I think. But um, to, like, bring back to that comment from, like, Fourth Wing, you know, looks like Fourth Wing, and they're like, oh, no, th you can overcome anything as long as you put in the work and put your mind to it. That's... Or this, it's like, no, people have actual physical limitations. Right, yeah. And, and this book, I think, is such a good example of that, where it's like, no, like that's why chains everything. that's why chains is raising them up as a crew because you have Callo and Galdo who are like mm -hmm. the jack of all trades and they can kind of do a little bit of everything and then you have he Locke they're silver at everything and gold at nothing right and then you have Locke who is like the mastermind just absolutely brilliant with this with like planning and getting getting everything and and like showmanship like being the mm -hmm. actor and then you have John who is amazing at math and brawling muscle and oh man and it even oh i can't wait for you to see the jean moments in book two because he shines let me tell you and i was just very surprised at how many of the characters were killed off in this book i think that's yes. what like really shocked me i didn't think like spoiler alert that it was just going to be Locke and jean it is just Locke and jean at, at the end the of the end. day and that was really surprising for me i'd never had a book that let you go that far into it yeah thinking like okay this is gonna be the core and then also towards the end i thought um eblis was that his name the doctor oh the dog the leech the the doctor who like helped them in the thing at the end eblis oh yeah the dog leech i don't remember his actual name but is yeah. that his name dog leech um whatever his name was um and I thought maybe they were going to pull him into their crew because, you know, he was willing to go up against I think the he goes Grey with King. them. 
because of what the Grey King did, but then he runs off at the end, and I was like, okay, I have no, no idea. I think, I think he runs back into the cabin, because I think he was on the ship with them, and they were like, he was like arguing with them, and they're like, we don't have time for your shit right now, and he's like, okay, and he goes back into the cabin, because I think he's in the second book. Is he? Okay. But I think so. My whole point is that I was prepared, and I've read books where like, you know, some of the main crew gets killed off, you know, um, I read crap what is his books they are so good jeff sprite spite he's oh, actually yeah. in connecticut he did umbra um why am i blanking on umbral, the name he did paladin uh paladin yes. unbound and then yes. umbral something yes and his was the first book where i read where you have this like whole crew and they're killed off immediately spoiler alert sorry um yeah. and then you get like a new crew and i guess that's the vibe i thought we were getting mm. it was like him setting up a new crew and so when i didn't get that at the end i was actually surprised because there was nothing about this book that i guess correctly nothing yeah right and that's yeah. rare yep. for me i feel like that's rare i can usually guess like one, two, maybe three things. There was nothing about this book that I had cracked. And I, and I think that's what people love about it is it's yeah. so it's so unguessable. Yeah. And when that just heartbreaking emotional moment hits where the where Calo and Galdo are killed, and then you have Bug that's killed just moments after, it is just a brutal blow along with all their money being gone. It is a brutal blow to the gentleman bastards. And the next one and a half books are focused on it's just Locke and John. Like it's just the two of them and they're it's them against the world and kind of what they do from there. And it's kind of looking at like what what does the gentleman bastards become well, now are they just surviving yeah. or what did they do and that's kind of what the second book is is looking at so uh i guess one last thing that i'll say before going into like our favorite moments and stuff is that i really paid attention to the world building this time around it's something that i didn't really think about in previous reads that much um but I loved Jean's time as a priest of Azagia, and it made me want to learn a lot about the the other gods and stuff. Um, what what are as a first time reader? What are your thoughts on like Paralandro and the Thirteenth and uh, like Azagia and, and all these other ones? I mean, I thought it was more like if I had to pick one to be with, I'd want to be with the Paralandro. You Paralandro know, Paralandro is awesome. Yeah, yeah, it felt like. They were in on the joke, you right. know. I mean, personally, I am not a religious person, sure. um, so it's always been really hard for me to fully comprehend people that are just able to place their faith, you know, fully right. in certain things. And I really like that they kind of played on that, you know. Like, and I was like, I mean, like this is the crew I'd want to be in. They're in on the joke, you know. Right. Uh, joke, but. I, that's who I would want to be a part of. I would definitely not want to be a part of the people that um, were close to death all the time. That's yeah, definitely that was scary. That was scary. <laughs> that I would want to be a part of. And I thought it was great that um, Jean left when he did because I was like, oh, where's this going to yeah, go? Yeah, he left at the perfect like, time. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, okay. I was they like, were like, and we're going to kill you a million different yeah. ways and it's yeah. going to be awesome. And he's like, Fuck that. <laughs> like, I already almost just gave up all of my secrets. I am not going to, you know, test myself any further than that. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, as someone who works a very typical scheduled job, it was like, oh, what would it be like to just, like, you know, your master sends you off for months at a time. Go infiltrate this, you know, brotherhood. And then when you feel like you have gone as far as you can, just, like, sneak away and how all of the different characters like would leave the different, you know, religious monasteries that they went to. Yeah. You know, Locke always had to make it really elaborate and it was something crazy. And I really enjoyed those little, you know, interludes from the book. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Caitlin says hi. She says, sorry, I'm so late. Oh, 
and uh, that is totally fine. We're just talking about Lies of Locke Lamora. We are in spoilers, if you if yes. you didn't know. We are spoiling Lies of Locke Lamora, just so you know. Um, but also, thank you so much for backing us at the uh, at the Greenbone tier. You're amazing. Thank you so much. You were shouted out at the beginning of the stream. Yes, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, I loved I loved Jean's time with the 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 Church of Azagia or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And it just made me think, I'm like, dude, I could, I could use a whole, okay, she's read it before. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm like, I could use a whole book on, on just like the Azagia stuff. Like I would love to know like more about, about this God or Paralandro or any of the other ones. I think we do learn about at least a couple more of them but you know there's 13 so like there's a lot to uh a lot to uncover um yeah but i just find them so interesting and just the world in general like the the elder glass towers and like where did these come from who were the elders and oh wait oh, it's it so interesting very closely resembled a book i read um what was it called and it actually got me thinking because I was like, okay, maybe this author ripped it off oh. from this, you know, yeah. where it's this current day, but they're living in what was clearly an advanced civilization at one point. And also like the will of the many where you have these like relics that nobody mm. understands how they work, yeah. but they want to keep them around. I love that kind of stuff in fantasy books. I yes, love it. But for me with this, it was like, okay, well, I want to know more about a that where did the elder glass do we find that out do, no. do we we so far i mean there's many books to come he wants to make seven books total um so i'm sure we do it some come out in like a really long time ago yeah we've been waiting on the fourth book for a while but like in the in the interview that i listened to last night it sounds like it sounds like it's ready to go like it sounds like we're closer than we've ever been it it doesn't sound like a patrick rothfuss situation where he's like maybe i wrote it maybe i didn't like scott lynch has mm-hmm. like written it um, yeah and so we're just kind of waiting on him to kind of finalize some things and like go through and do some like final mm-hmm. editing and stuff so I, I think we're pretty damn close yeah i really want to know more about the mages that's like what i am specifically really freaking interested in because the terror i felt as a reader (laughs) just (laughs) reading it and being like oh my god like you are just so out of your depth in any fight against them and the lock was somehow able to figure out a way sort of around you know the constraints that he was in although i said earlier you know even though you didn't kill him, I think you still fucked yourself. Like they're yeah. still gonna come after you, you know. Um, but yeah. I, I really wanted to know more about that. I, I would, I was dying to know what it takes to be an initiate and what the process is, and you know, who was the first one that said to the second one, you know, you better follow me or I'm gonna kill you. And then you know, pyramid schemed it until they are what they are today i don't know if you'll find out that exactly but you'll get a lot more information on them for sure no but just like in general that was like a moment where i was like oh i might be more interested at this moment about like this lore (laughs) yeah i really like the history of them like burning uh or no they took over carthane and then they burned um theron pell they burned theron Theron pell to the ground and it was just such a cool demonstration of like you cannot mess with us like and it even said that they sent le- um, a, a smaller amount of mages out to the battle than there were warriors on the other side yeah. just as a show oh, wow. of like disrespect <laughs> and they just burned everything to the ground and then they kept the throne in the middle of it they like shielded the throne while they burned everything else I'm like, God, that's so cool. That's so sick. It's just like a power statement. And even if it's like from the side that, you know, I'm not rooting for, I'm still like, damn, like you got them. Right, right. You got (laughs) them. Like you, you showed them right then and there. You like displayed your power. And I have to have respect for that at the end of the day, like regardless. And what it did too, is it made the rest of the world 
take notice of them like you do not fuck with the bonds mage like you will mm-hmm. you'll see that in the next couple Ooh. books where people are like we do not fuck with bonds mages like we don't i felt that way during this book yeah when they sure. told the stories yeah of how if you murdered one what they did to you so that's yeah. why when lock while not murdering him cuts off every fucking finger and his tongue i was like dude you are it's not more fucked at right this point. Like, yeah i i don't see how you thought in any way like you might as well have killed him right yep <laughs> That's how I felt. I'm like, this does not save you, technicality wise. If anything, they take this as more of an insult, and they don't want others to know how you bested their rule. Yeah, and, they don't and, want this to spread. And what they should have done is, um, you know, at the end of the book, we see them put, or we don't see them do it, but the falconer is found on a cart, and it was like, send him back to Carthane or whatever. And it's like, why did you not, like, if you didn't want to kill him or whatever, why would you not, like, do everything you did and then put him in, like, a cellar somewhere or, like, hide him away somewhere? Like, why would you send him back to Carthane? Yes. Or find a way to bring him to your side. That's what I was expecting. Like, find a way to convince him. That would be a very Locke Lamora type of thing of, like, let me pour sweet words of honey in your ear and now you're going to... Listen to me instead of I don't him. Know. Except for that Falconer guy was a total fucking asshole. Yeah. So I don't know what he could have done there, but that's where I thought it was going to go. Hmm. Um, okay. Because the way that it went, I had thought through and I was like, no. That's a big like, assumption. Save you. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think at, at that point, I don't think there's any sort of like silver tonguing Winning. you can do to mm-hmm. to bring him to your side. Yeah. I, I think it was like, how can you just get through this alive? Yeah. For this moment. Yeah. Like I'll worry about what comes after later. <laughs> right, right. Um so let's let's talk about some of our, our favorite scenes here. And I guess uh I guess we can jump around since we're talking about the Falconer. Um I would love to talk about how what caitlin said oh what caitlin say i've only read the first book but i think he did that the author for plot reasons in later books yeah definitely yeah they they definitely they definitely maimed the falconer for it to come back in in later books definitely which is interesting because the way they ended is like you almost think like is he crazy did like Locke end up like breaking him mentally with the way he's like mmm, mmm, you know at the mm. end that i thought like oh did he go crazy like is he oh, actually yeah. not like mm, there oh, yeah. anymore totally totally nice caitlin i liked that <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i one of my one of my favorite moments in the book and i want to get this like on a t-shirt or something but chains tells him uh there's like a flashback you know Locke gets captured by these people and there's just a quick flashback to chains telling him like this is what a bonds mage is we don't ever fuck with them like we're very careful around them and like you show them the utmost respect you get on your knees and you grovel in front of a bonds mage yeah. and then it flips back to Locke in present day first words on the page are nice bird asshole <laughs> I love that line so much. It is like one of my favorite lines in like all the fantasy I've read. It is one of my utmost favorites. Yes. And uh, yeah. Which is why I can't get over when you met that person with the bird tattoo recently that you didn't say nice bird asshole. (laughs) She would have been like, why are you calling me an asshole? She she absolutely would have, but... (laughs) In our it would have been, world, it been funny for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, it was um, great when he fucking killed that goddamn vulture, or whatever the hell it was. Oh god, that was such a moment where he like so hits it with the axe, <laughs> and and then the the bonds mage reacts, and you you finally get the impression that he feels he not only sees everything the bird sees but he feels everything the bird feels and so in those moments of death he feels like the fear and the everything and the pain and it was just this moment where like 
you almost feel for the bonds mage for just a second where it's yeah, like it's oh like you feel you felt your falcon die and well, later on you'll learn what that falcon meant to him and you'll feel even worse uh, well i was gonna ask you how you felt when okay so Locke is approached by the gray king and it's like we know who you are we know you're the thorn blah blah blah, blah. you're gonna excuse me pretend to be me Mm-hmm. So when they get to the final night where he's pretending to be the Grey King and everything immediately goes wrong and they're like, he can't understand why it hasn't worked out the way he had been told. Did you immediately know that like this was the Grey King's plan all along or did you think it was going pear-shaped? Did I know that what was the Grey King's plan all along? So that the Grey King wanted Locke to take the fall. Oh, yeah. It's him. You knew it immediately. See, I, I at first was like, mm. why is this going wrong? Why is this getting fucked up? And it took me until he was shoved in the p- barrel of horse piss that I was like, oh, this is w- this is what the Grey King wanted. Yeah, the Grey King, I think he wanted everybody to think that they had killed Locke or mm-hmm. had killed the Grey That's King. That's him. Yeah. Um, they wanted everybody to think that they had killed him in order to bring them out of hiding because he couldn't get mm-hmm. to them in the place that they were locked inside. And yeah, so, but before you realize that, just in like him being there as the Grey King and it's all going wrong, were you like, oh, this is on purpose? No, I, I don't think I quite knew where exactly it was going. But at a certain point, you're like, oh, this had to be part of his plan for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But like I thought it was interesting how they threw in the bit where they're like, no, he didn't want to pay the bonds mage any longer, so like he had them set the spell up for like just tonight and I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe that's it. So I think I so the guy so when uh when Kappa Barsavi tells Locked Locke described as or disguised as the Grey King when he when he's telling him, Yeah, we had some like secret messengers come over here and tell us that he can be punched and like hit with blunt objects. He just can't be pierced and he stopped paying his bonds mage or whatever. I think that those people that like went and told Barsavi that were plants and that there is no like I, I think the bonds mage could absolutely protect the Great King from blunt attacks. But he had had the Bonds Mage set up the spell in a way where it's only like piercing damage because he wanted Locke to just get the shit kicked out of him. Like he wanted. Yeah. Because they said the spell was set up, but the Bonds Mage talked to him in his head. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, he's still on the payroll for sure. Before everything went down. So I'm like, wait, he, he was there. Yeah, he's still on the payroll without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. But did he get it fronted? Because he said that the payment that they stole from Locke was going to be, like, what, like, paid off the whole thing? And I'm like, so was he able to get it on consignment? That doesn't seem like something they would do. No, I, I think that's exactly what happened. I think it was, um, I think Kappa Raza's plan, the Grey King's plan, was, like, I will inscript a Bonds Mage and pay him at the end of this from all the treasure I get from Kappa Barsavi and Lock Lamora and all of them. And if it all goes pear-shaped, then I'm going to die. So I won't need to pay him anyways. So but it seems to me that the Bond Mages, with who they were, what we learned about them, like were the type of people who were like, no, we're taking our payment up front or we're not doing the work. That was like... Might've... He might have had like a large down payment to like put it to uh-huh. throw into it. Yeah. Um, but I got the impression that like everything that he got from Barsavi and all of them were going to the Bonds Mage for services rendered. Like, He's like, I, listen, help me, and like, this is what we're going to get, and this right. is what I'll be able to give you if you help me. Right, right. Yeah. I guess I just, the feeling I got from it was like, no, they wouldn't have taken, they were taking their money up front. You know what I yeah. mean? That was what I had assumed, I guess. <laughs> For sure. Um, so kind of running back to the beginning real quick, I love this description of Locke Lamora when Chains is talking to um, the Thief Maker. Mm-hmm. And the Thief Maker says, if he had a bloody gash across his throat and the physiker was trying to sew it up, the boy would steal the needle and thread and die laughing. 
I'm like, pretty, man, pretty sums it up. that is such a great, <laughs> that is such a great, um, I guess, like representation of, uh, of Locke Lamora. Yeah. And then Chains later says to him, uh, this was just funny. Chains is like, and that's why I paid for you, my boy, though you do lack the good sense the gods gave a carrot. <laughs> Right. Like it's all so like just brilliant. Like I never would have thought to up. say that to somebody. Yeah, in the way where you know the the major theme is like, what is that thing where like you grab one stick and they're like, look how easy you break. But if I put the bundle of sticks together, like look, I can't break you. And I feel like that's what the message was trying to give the whole time is that like as one you're one but as like two or three you are so many more like play off of your strength yeah just because you may not be physically strong doesn't mean you couldn't be capably the most strongest player of the team and but if we all work together and we all know what we're all best at like we can take on anything yeah yeah what what did you think of his of his uh learning in the house of Paralandro, his his education, um, just the way that Chains kind of handled all of them as a group. Do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, I think it couldn't have been handled more perfectly. And I was actually really surprised where um, Jean is brought in and, you know, Locke is really mad at first and, you know, Jean like tackles him and all that and Chains is like, no, you deserved it, you know? As I was reading it, I had to like visibly like control my anger because I was seeing it as if I was locked and I was like, fuck chains, fuck John, like no, like fuck all this. And then when he like went up to the roof and apologized and was yes, like, Yes, it's such I'm a good sorry, scene. I yeah, I didn't realize your parents just died. You know, I've had so many years at this point and blah 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 blah. Like to me, that was one of the most real and vulnerable moments because I was like, see my anger and run away with me. And I was just reading the book. Yeah. You know, and here's the character realizing the situation he had been thrown into and saying, I'm not going to make this a bad thing. I'm going to use it to my advantage, but not in like, I might using him way. Like, let me not be mad at you for something you can't help. And I can't help. So like, let's team up. And that was that was just really so great. great. It, it caught me by surprise because Locke had me so caught up in his anger in that moment that like yeah. I was prepared for him. I was like, how do they eventually become friends? I don't see it. And for him to go up and say, you know, I'm sorry and why you realized it, it was it was really sweet. I loved <laughs> I loved when he brings John the uh the glasses and he's like, I stole these glasses for you and he's like, Oh, I really appreciate it, but these are you like far sighted glasses. And he's like, it's okay, we'll go steal more tomorrow. And he's like, you'll teach me how to steal? He's like, yeah, and you'll teach me how to do math. And yeah. Jean says, uh, like, won't, won't that be dangerous or whatever? And Locke is like, maybe for other people, but for the gentleman bastards, it's just what we do. And Jean yeah. says, we? And Locke says, we. And I'm just we. like crying, like, yeah. yes, we, the gentleman bastards. Yeah. I think Caitlin <laughs> says it well. She said, Mama Bear came out for the characters with those flashbacks. Yeah. Um, same, Caitlin. I have a seven year old, and it was a very much like a, oh, you just want to like protect, like immediately. Like, right. Even though I understood Locke's anger initially, I'm like, I want you all to be friends. Like, let's all just like get along. We can, we can do so much more together than, you know, if we're, angry with each other so I, I agree with that like it was a mom bear instinct where I was like <laughs> angry but I also want everyone to be friends okay right yeah <laughs> we can do more as a team yeah definitely <laughs> um what, what do you think about Locke's uh this price that he has on his head um at the beginning he gets a, he gets a couple kids killed in the Shades uh Shades Hill gang yeah. Um, and now he's got he's got to earn all this back. I thought it was the perfect like real life, not like a simple lesson, but like a real life lesson that kicks off the whole rest of the book and how Locke will perceive now yeah. because they've always said Locke is like crazy. Like he just comes up with all these like harebrained ideas and like doesn't really think through the 
major consequences. Spider web yeah. effects that come with the things you do. And I am someone who is just constantly aware of anything I do, how it may affect others. So I knew from the beginning, like, oh, he needs to really, like, look more closely at the plans that he's making instead of just being like am I getting what I want out of this situation right. so it, it hit me like in the gut you know when you found out that like not only did uh, the two guys that he, the one guy that he set up plus his best friend die but then all the other Shades Hill kids that had known about his plan died and I was like you know what this is what he needed though yeah. to be more careful throughout the rest of the book but I also knew it was not going to be the real life lesson I knew it was not enough like it was with Callow and Galdo and Bug later Yeah, um, I knew it wasn't enough but I knew it was enough to set him on a more like oh I need to be more aware Right. I mean I did not see at the end when the spider figures out like oh he said what was the word um the principle or the um oh oh uh for uh posterity posterity yeah i did not get it until it was explained to me that that was the death offering and yep. i was like yeah what a crazy death offering yeah that's such I thought a good he moment was doing it on purpose because he figured to go later plunder the right. ship on his own yeah that's what i thought yeah that was his death offering for callow and galdo and bug so sick is so but the satisfying. The spider figured it out. I know, was yeah. Just... I would love her backstory. Right? I love her story. Yeah. Well, you know, we get uh, the Salvaras at the end. They're taking over the mantle of Spider, and so it'll be interesting to see them sometime in the future. Will uh, they work with Flock? Will they hold a grudge? Or are they right. grateful that it led them to the life that they will now be leading? I mean, because the spider said it, I thought, very plainly in a way that it needed to be said, where, like, you think this is a gift, it's not. <laughs> right, yeah. It's an obligation. Well, um, you know, we were talking about revenge earlier, like the revenge of Locke for his crew, the revenge of the Great King for... Uh, you know, his family that was murdered and maybe the Salvaras will will take revenge as well. Did um, you not think it was very much like that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind? Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I was thinking the whole time. Who's going to break the cycle? Yeah. Because if you continue it, someone is pretty much almost guaranteed to continue it after it. Have Who you, is going to be the, the one? Have you played the Last of Us games? Yes, I played... Okay. No, I'm sorry, I played Fallout. I, oh, I was, okay. I, we played The Last of Us. We have, like, the still disc from our old PS3 or 4, um, but we didn't play a lot of it. I think yeah. my husband did. I didn't. Okay. If you want, uh, If you want a really, really, really good story about what the cycle of revenge does to a person... Last mm -hmm. of Us 1 and 2 are amazing for that. The game? Ama yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I definitely have the first game. First or second, I have one of them. <laughs> I just re remember when we watched the show, my husband, like, buried it out of our, you know, yeah. old uh, bookshelf, and we found one of them, and we played it for a bit, and it was very actually, like, consistent with, like, the show from the game in the beginning, but we didn't make it that far. Right, right. Um, I have another funny quote from from Chains where he's talking about uh, what kind of man Barsavi is to young Locke. And he's talking about this carpet that Barsavi would roll out whenever he was having like a peaceful discussion or whatever. I love that part. And so then, you know, he he brings in all these guys that he basically wants to, to murder into this banquet. Uh, but he's got the carpet rolled out. So they were all at ease. And, and he loves it. He would never. Yeah. And get out. he says, you can imagine just how surprised they were when they sat down in their chairs on that beautiful carpet and 50 of Barsavi's men piled into the room and shot those poor idiots so full of bolts that a porcupine in heat would have taken one home and fucked him. <laughs> Very, <laughs> it's um, such a me. brilliant sentence. Like, oh my God. <laughs> night angel that's a very night angel type yes quote right there for sure yeah <laughs> definitely 
What do you think your biggest surprise in the book was for you? Book one. My biggest surprise was the two shark dancer sisters being in on the whole thing for the the gray king oh yeah that's a good surprise for sure (laughs) i did not see it coming for sure (laughs) who Um, was yours man there's so many i think my biggest surprise um i mean it's got to be the twins dying like i just did not like they from the beginning of the book they seem like guys that will be there until the end like they seem like guys that will go on through the series yes. and will be this crew. It was like a whole crew. <laughs> yeah, and and to pull off uh, like a George R.R. R. Martin and kill off Ned like Stark. three of your main, yeah, three of your main <laughs> characters halfway through the first book. And I don't think I realized before, you know, before this read, I had always thought that they got killed off near the very end but it's actually more like in the middle of the book it's a little after the middle part yeah that's like basically where i started this morning yeah and uh and so it's kind of wild to uh to like just kill off those characters and in such a brutal way and in a way where i feel like we didn't like get what they deserved caitlin i was yeah. pissed the twins i almost threw the dang paper back. yeah i feel about it because i don't feel like they got the written word that they deserved um it felt very right. abrupt and sudden to me and i understood it in the context of like this is what needed to happen um but we didn't get anything leading up to it yeah it was just like bam they're dead yeah it was like and i was very confused about jean and it, um and why he wasn't fighting at that point and i had to go back and like reread it again to realize that his name sewn in on the hand mm-hmm. had made it so he couldn't even move i understood about the falcon guy and you know what i could do with your name and all of that but i didn't understand why it had suddenly struck him or that it had struck him in general yeah um and so i had to i had to go back and reread those few pages yeah for sure what one thing that I think was done so well about the twins death was just the way the way it felt so real you know you and I were talking before the before we started the actual show um, about a friend of mine that had passed away somewhat recently and when you look at the twins death the scene that they're in before that i forget exactly what it is but it's basically like making plans for that night and like okay we'll all come back here and we'll see each other again and you know that kind of feeling and it's so true that when someone when someone passes away it's not how it's usually handled in fantasy books where it's like it's this long drawn out death where they get some final words and they can tell each other like i love you or whatever it's it's never really like that like sometimes you just someone is just dead and you didn't get to have those final moments with them and that's really what this felt like is like there was no there was no goodbye there was no yeah yeah, there was no like final moment where they're like dying in their arms or anything it's like they just they come home and they're just dead and that's yeah like Locke walks down there and he sees them both dead and i was like wait what like i was like this is this is what we're getting yeah <laughs> caitlin For says them? i would i would 100 percent be okay with the resurrection trope just to bring the twins okay. back i will say one one great thing about this series is that we get flashbacks throughout all of the books oh so that's that's okay. one great thing. Um, oh, and she says, "I'm sorry for your loss, Spencer. Thank you so much." Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I think it was handled really well as far as like how it was written. Did it hurt? Did it not feel great? Of course, but from like a literary sense, from like a writing perspective, uh, I think it was such an incredible use of the reader's emotional investment i thought it was was, a shock it was a total shock like i did not see it coming in any way yeah for sure and then for bug to die like minutes later it was just like fuck dude like and bug was someone who like 
He was I so good. I loved how he was like the newbie and he had found his role and like his role was like falling off of buildings or high heights. Like I loved that. I thought it was hilarious that, yeah. you know, like that was his thing. And that, that, that caught me. That yeah. caught me. That was Because I just was not prepared for it. And then it was kind of a really quick thing. Mm-hmm. And I almost felt like I needed a little more like they just des- those characters deserved a little more you know yeah. yeah for sure for sure yeah these these books do a really great job with with just death in general like a, a lot of people die in these books and it's just it's it's not it doesn't get any easier every time somebody dies and I, it's just so true to so true to reality <laughs> Uh, he, he was, was a sweet summer child. <laughs> this dang book had me on the verge of tears. Oh yeah, the first time, I mean, the first time I read it, I was like openly crying at this book. There was like <laughs> multiple moments. And uh, and the second book is even worse, I will say with that. Oh. Like it is, the, there are some devastating moments in the second book. Great. <laughs> um, I, Thanks for the recommendation, Spencer. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, I want to go through uh, some of these other quotes because I think there's so many that are just hilarious. Um, yes, and I am running a little short on time. I've got like oh, 20 minutes left. 20 minutes? Okay, cool. Mm. Okay, so uh, Chain says, you know, he's explaining um, like Locke has just been to Kappa Barsavi for the first time and he had like the shark tooth in his mouth and all that. <laughs> and Chain says... If unless your eyes and ears have been stitched shut with rawhide these past two days, by now you must have realized that I intend for you and Kahlo and Galdo and Sabatha to be nothing less than a fucking ballista bolt right through the heart of Van Carlo's precious secret piece. Um, it's just, God, what a sentence, first of all. But And what about the secret piece in general? To me, that was fascinating right yeah i was hoping you would like that because i think it's that such it's a like cool twist secret deal between the you know the aristocracy and... yeah and they don't know that like this is like why the piece is i loved that that was one of my favorite part of the books like oh the secret piece really is a secret Piece. Yeah, and like the merchants, like the everyday merchants, like don't know about it, and they don't know why they're just getting bombarded with thieves. Yep. And the nobility is just like, just like sipping their tea, like. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I think, yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah, and I think it was such a smart idea to base like the gentleman ba- like it's such a smart idea on Scott Lynch's part to base the gentleman bastards around that idea because if you just have a city of thieves like what makes your group of thieves any better or any different to any of the other ones and by having this secret peace and having this group that doesn't care about it 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 immediately makes them significantly better than everybody else like they not only are they pulling a ruse on the world and on uh the nobility but also on kappa barsavi like also he doesn't have any idea that they are doing this behind closed doors and i think that just like makes them all the more brilliant like it it puts such a a spotlight on them for the reader I thought of it in this way where, okay, if everyone's a thief and we're all like hiding, you know, then no one's a thief and no one's hiding. Right. And Locke and his crew have now taken thieving to the next level. Right. The regular thieving is so normalized that it's actually not a thing anymore. Yeah. And now the real thieves can thieve the thieves. If that makes sense. For sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting where it was like, all right, you want to try to like normalize thieving? There are eventually going to be thieves that will out thieve you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to they're going to be better than you. Someone's yeah. going to come along and that's going to think outside the box. I liked how the book revolved around like, OK, like, yeah, there's this world and all like the nobles believe like this is the like normal uh, lawful world that we are living in. But guess what? This is how things are actually done. Right. Yeah. 
100%. Um, I have some quotes. These are some of my favorite quotes in the entire book is when they're at uh, Harza's, Har- Harza's shop uh, before they go in to like pay their dues or whatever, yeah. like in the adult timeline. Yeah. Um, and Harza says, you'd steal shit from a dog's asshole if only you had the right sort of bag to bring it home with you. <laughs> and? And then... And- <laughs> and then, and then Luke's or uh, Locke says um, he's like arguing back and forth with them, and he says, uh, "No, I want four Solons too." And Harza says, "The gods wouldn't get four and two from me." Morgante himself, with a flaming sword and ten naked virgins yanking at my breeches, might get four Solons. One, you get three and four, and that's final. <laughs> and then. Uh, I like the the chains quote you have, where it says, "Someday, Locke Lamora, someday you're going to fuck up so magnificently, yes. so ambitiously, so overwhelmingly that the sky will light up and the moons will spin and the gods themselves will shit comets with glee." Wait, <laughs> did I just repeat you? No, no, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, um, ah, uh, and he said, "Oh, and I hope I'm still around to see it." By the way, we don't know like how or why chains died. Do we find that out? Right. Um, I can't is remember it like a major honestly. Plot point or just like a minor. What? Well, sorry. Is it like a major plot point or just like a minor background? Not, not so far. It hasn't been like a major plot point. It's been okay. like a background thing. Because sure. that's how I was getting the feel of it. it. Yeah. It didn't feel like he had been like murdered in any crazy way, and they needed revenge. It seemed like maybe he like just got old and passed yeah. away. I yeah. Like, I think I think that's more or less what what happened. I I can't quite remember if we get any like particular knowledge about I just loved chains and I was I I loved his interlude so it was like sad to know he was in the beginning but like another favorite thing was when chains um brings Locke in and he's you know introducing him to everything and the day that he says like the day that Calo or Galdo or Gallo um go to Locke for advice is the day that like Locke is really in charge right and Locke in his head goes what chains didn't realize that they they had asked me like something earlier that day and i was like damn yeah like, yeah i, I love you love to see people getting along and realizing what they can do together if they don't let like i need to be in charge be like their main right you know point of doing what they do and i just love that kind of like buddy i i love that scene where <laughs> where Locke is like cooking up this scheme to like get them a dead body yeah, like that yes. whole thing, and like that was the day that Calo and Galdo realized that he was going to be the leader, and that they would be like a backseat to him, but yeah. also important. And... and that confused me a bit. I thought that she was in on it, hmm. and they were trying to create a diversion for her to take the body from the cart, oh, so okay. nobody would notice. So it would be like fine. Right. I didn't realize that they were actually conning her at first. Right. Oh yeah, it was a total con for everybody yeah, involved. That was amazing. And I, and I loved when Chains was like, um, he was like, why why have I been getting people coming up to me all day just like giving okay. me a ton of money? And sorry for Vera, whatever the place was. Yeah, and they, uh, yeah, they like they tell him about it, and what does he say? He's like. Blutter, uh, bugger me bloody with a boat hook <laughs> is what Shane says. And I thought that was so funny. I loved it. And just I loved like, hearing about how they came together. I really, I really yeah. enjoyed the interludes. And a lot of times I can get bored with interludes where I'm like, all right, let me get back to like the regular story. And I had none of that with yeah. any, any of them. For sure, because yeah. By the time I was halfway through the book, I was like, oh, all of these have a very important yeah reason for being here yeah pay attention definitely i would say the the second book is my favorite i would say the the interludes are pretty good uh but then when you get to the third book the interludes like i i just want the whole book to be the interludes like they are the interludes are the star of the show in the third book for sure yeah they're amazing i'm gonna bring book two down with me although i do need to fucking read harry potter for next week yes (laughs) yeah and and watch the movie (laughs) i have my special book i have my special book that i got because of you oh nice that's awesome that's super (laughs) cool um 
but yeah, just so you know, we do watch the movie for those as well, and we kind of compare the two. Just, oh, just so you're aware. Friends. I will. You have to give me absolutely no prodding to rewatch the movie. <laughs> absolutely none whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, um. We talked about Young John joining joining the Gentleman Bastards and him like punching Locke, and I just love this. Bloomf! He said, his mouth full of blood and pain. <laughs> lock i just love when he had that happen and then you like i'm like okay is chains gonna react or not and then he's like you deserved it and i'm like oh shit yeah for <laughs> sure for sure uh caitlin will be reading um and discussing the chamber of secrets the second book in the harry potter series um let's see what else what do we what do we want to what do we want to wrap up with? Oh, oh no, wait, wait, hang on. There's, there's a really funny quote. This is one of my favorites as well. Uh, there's a few things I want to ask the Grey King after all of this is over. Philosophical questions like, how does it feel to be hung out a window by a rope tied around your balls, motherfucker? <laughs> I'm just like, dude, this is one of those books where I'm just like, how is the dialogue so good like every I time think it speaks in a way of like how if we were in these positions like you and i would have <laughs> like responded i would have been like get the fuck out of here go fuck yourself you yeah. know like where you very rarely find that in books where it's like no what can i say to get out of this situation where people like me have no fucking filter and if you piss me off i'm gonna tell you i will not be able to hold right. it in. and i felt like that was yeah. represented with Locke. For sure, yeah. <laughs> Especially in the situations he was in. I would not be able to be like, okay, murder me then. Just let me get my last goddamn verbal shot in at you. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> I can die happy. I can die happy. Yeah, for sure. What What did you think about the, um, like, the callback to, I don't need to run and fight. I just need to keep you here until Jean gets back. Like, the okay. there's, like, the so interlude, and then there's the Grey King one. I thought it was fake because, you know, Jean had just been, like, ripped up across the stomach and had all these stitches and, like, he had told him to stay in bed. Right. So I thought it was him just fucking with the Grey King's head. Like, that's what I thought. Like, to be like, let me buy myself a little more time. That's what it or, was, yeah. Yeah, and I did not expect him to actually show up. Oh, which afterwards, I mean, yeah. Granted, it was after the fact. Like, right. you know, Locke had already killed him or whatever. But I thought he was just bullshitting the whole time. Yeah. So then for Jean to actually show up, and while the Grey King was dead, he did still save Locke's life. Right. Yeah, I I, I love I love that turn of events. Um, I do think that it would have been more true to the group to have Jean actually show up and deliver the final blow. But... I'm also because we're following Locke and we're in Locke's head. I'm I'm also really glad that he was the one who was able to deliver like the stabbing like from behind the back. Yeah. And the whole the whole thing he's doing here is so true to his character because everything. I mean, the book is called The Lies of Locke Lamora. Yeah. And and his whole thing is like teasing and misdirecting and like look over here while I do this thing over here and that's like his whole MO and for mm -hmm. this big like boss battle to be happening at the end of the book mm -hmm. and he like doesn't actually have Jean there but he has this reputation of Jean showing up for him to get him out of these scrapes like it's it's built up enough of oh, a reputation to where the Grey King knows about it and he knows that Jean is the bruiser and it's like Locke You're gonna just, underestimate me. Yeah. And I'm Locke, gonna take advantage of it. Locke just throws out like this misdirect and it's the perfect amount With of the coin. time. Yep. Oh god, it's so it's so good. Um It was like the perfect culmination of yes. what I needed where like Jean killed the two twin sisters, which right. is like, okay, he played his part then. Right. I don't need him to kill the Grey King now. Now Locke can do it on his own. And looking back on it now, I'm like, that was a really smart way to play it as the author. It's so perfect. It's mm -hmm. so perfect. It, it really was. Oh, 
Before we go, we have to talk about my favorite scene in the whole series. This is my favorite scene out of all three books. The Miragio game. Chapter 13, when he needs a suit and he goes to Miragio's. It annoyed oh, me. It annoyed you? Why? I think on, an, on another reread, it wouldn't annoy me. But I think it annoyed me because at first I thought he was going to screw Ben Javier or whatever his name was. Yeah. And that really pissed me off. I was like, dude, did you not learn your lesson from the beginning of the book where other people could die because of your actions? Right. So that's where I thought it was going. So when he finally at the end set it up so he could run away, I was like, okay. But in my head, I'm like, what if he had a wife? What if he had a kids? He couldn't just run away. Like, that's where my brain went, and that really upset me. It really upset me, Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, it's it's upsetting. I think um, it's just so, it's just so, so true to who Locke is, though. Like, he, if he is, if he has his back to the wall, he won't just lie once. He will lie and lie and lie and lie and lie and I'm turn so several and not just turn one corner but turn corner after corner after corner after corner and mm -hmm. he will dig himself in so deep to where there's like these overwhelming repercussions and i just thought it was the most genius piece of writing like one of the most genius pieces of writing that i've ever read i was like how did scott lynch think of this like how did he like develop this in his head because you think that he's going to take ben javier and yeah. take his clothes and then find a way to get like a slightly better suit or something but he goes up to Miragio and convinces him that he's working with the gray king and that he, Miragio needs to fall in line and like Oh man, just and thing after Mirage thing after sees thing. sees him at the like ooh, the tower thing, and mm -hmm. he's like yes. recognizes his clothes. <laughs> and then he lies again, and he's like, <laughs> "Oh so yes, stupid. I asked the tailor like what the best ma best dressed <laughs> yeah. man in the city wears, and he gave me this." And Mirage yeah. is like, "Oh, sorry, excuse me." Like, yeah, it's just oh, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> I I love that so much. Yeah. And then. And then yeah, at the end I liked that he that he did come back with the year's worth of pay and he's just yeah. like take this run away. He's like I what what's the quote I have? It's uh uh understanding is a luxury. You don't get to have it. Sorry. Yeah. And I don't have the time. Go. Oh. <laughs> such a such a good moment. And like yeah, it sucks. It sucks for Ben Javier, but it just shows you like how far Locke is willing to go and how deep at that it, point yeah and it well not only at that point but I think just in general it shows you because we're getting like this long game that we're seeing over an entire book where we finally get that memo but this is like a chapter where you yeah. see how far it spirals for Locke to get mm -hmm. what he needs and it's mm -hmm. such a good example of who Locke is at the core of himself like it's yeah. such a perfect example of of what Agreed. he does yeah I think we pretty much uh we pretty much got to everything um there there are a couple quotes from him killing the the bonds mage uh I'm not gonna kill you we're gonna play a game I like to call scream and fucking pain until you answer my questions <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so fucked and then he says uh, at the end he says uh, the, the bonds mage is like but my client and he says you no longer have a client he hired a bonds mage not a fingerless freak with a dead bird for a best friend I fucking loved that I was like wow <laughs> I didn't understand what they meant initially about being like he your appointment has ended and then I was like oh because you are technically now no longer a bonds mage right. so yeah your employment is ended Yep. That was great. Yeah, there's there's some great things near the end. We didn't really talk about him um, getting caught by the spider. Um, do you do you have any thoughts on this? Where he like gets caught up in the tower and then escapes and then comes back and kind of saves everybody. Do you have any quick thoughts I mean, on that? It semi reminded me of like a mix up of a few other books I've read, but I'm now thinking that like those books were written after after Lock Lamar. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe like they got it from this. Um it very much reminded me of The Mask of Mirrors oh. and 
Um, I can't remember what the other one is. Um, the name of all things or something where I was like, you're going to confuse me in a way that doesn't seem relevant to the story. So I am just going to kind of coast over these facts. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you? I mean, but I, I liked it. I liked that it was this unsuspecting old woman, but like, I feel like she was revealed to us in such an obvious manner that. It maybe right. could have been done a little more subtly to be like, oh, she's the spider. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think we probably could have found out when Locke finds out. Like, instead of finding out beforehand, we could have found yeah. out when he does. Um, and that might have worked a little bit better. Uh, but I thought it was really interesting. The first time I read this, I was like, why is he going back? I think that the story needed something besides just Locke's immediate like friend group I I think we as the reader needed to see that he cares about something beyond like Him screwing everything over yeah he, he, he needs to have some sort of principles um, he needed that like moral compass and yeah. I think like that proved it to us that he's like a good human being right he like he's just dealt that or what is it with the hand your doll you yeah. know he's just played the hand he's dealt right yeah for sure and like does he have disdain for the nobility like maybe but he doesn't want them to die in mass you know what i mean he, he doesn't want to extinguish them right. he's not like oh they're all bad they're all you know they should all be taken out yeah and, and Locke even tells the great king like you wanted to kill the children like what is wrong with you and so you see that he does have like some morals well, however baseline they may be yeah and to me it was worse than death like yeah, to, for sure. to steal these people was yeah. was worse than death yeah definitely definitely yeah i i i just loved the ending there where he like shows up and he has to convince everybody that he came back for a reason and for the mm -hmm. right reason and all of that um and so i thought that that was a fun that was a fun bit. Like I'm glad I'm glad that Scott Lynch did it. And mm. I think at the end where he like convinces them to sink the ship that has all the money on it and then they go out to the ship that he told them to go to and the ship is literally full of shit. Like they say that in the text. They're like, "So the yeah. ship is like actually full of shit." And she's like, yeah. "Yep." And he's like, "There's three of them. One of them has it hidden in it to make him have to look through all of them." Yes, you know? that's so smart. <laughs> they have to look through every single one yeah that's so funny uh so, so funny. good um so i guess uh you know as we get to the very very end like literally like the last couple sentences um we kind of get a cool call back um so after he kills the bonds mage he looks at jean and he says so this is revenge and jean says it is and he says it's a shit business and then after he kills the Grey King, he says, so this is winning. It is. It can go fuck itself. And I loved just like that little that little tie back to just like a couple chapters earlier. Um, and then they kind of, they go on their way. You know, we see, we see Locke and John on the ship. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you know, we're going to go into our final thoughts right here. Do you have any idea where the series is going? I mean, this whole first book almost feels like a prequel. Yes, of it like very much does. The real what now? Mm -hmm. Everything we've you know thought was going to be our lives and how things were going to go. Um, how do we deal with that being disrupted in such a way that like it's not even a possibility anymore? And I don't see how they could, could even like go on living their lives where they were location wise you yeah, know now that they burned all their sure. bridges um so i like that i like the idea of really not having any idea somewhat of where the next book will go other than that they're trying to rebuild their lives right okay yeah that's all i that's just awesome. really want to know what sabatha how do you say her name i'm just <laughs> Yeah, I need to know. It's it's. If I don't find it soon enough, I will Google it myself. No, and don't. It. 
No, 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 you can't. It is such a good reveal. You have to you have to stay chill. You have to stay chill. I don't like <laughs> when authors make you wait for multiple fucking books for something that they dropped in book one. There's I don't only, like it. There's only three books, though. It's not like it's like ten books or something. They're long goddamn books, man. <laughs> They're long books. Not if you do the audio. something so frequently through book one and you're telling me I'm not going to get any answers to until book three i mean no you'll, you'll get some in book two but book I'll, okay so book three is like where you where you, yeah you see the most yeah the most that you'll get that pisses me off <laughs> i will still read the next book like i will still move on but as a reader that pisses me off like oh, then don't bring it up don't bring it up so frequently. Don't no, be Samantha's away, Samantha's away, Samantha's away. Locks in love with her, but no, we're not going to tell you any background information. But would it would it not be worse if you get to the third book and like you find out all this stuff and you're like, well, wait, where was the foreshadowing for this? Like, where was this mentioned at all before? Like that that's Doesn't what pisses me off. It's really then. To to me, it's just like if you're going to leave these like breadcrumbs, I need more. Hmm. I'm sorry. Do not piss me off where I'm reading and I'm like, oh, you're not going to give me any more fucking information in this book or maybe the next one. Oh, like, man. I, it, to me, that pissed me off. I, that, <laughs> that was my one complaint of the book where it was like, why even fucking mention her? Oh, I get it. I yeah. understand. Logically, if it's something you want to introduce later, you have to like leave this like trail of why they're relevant to the story. But don't make someone so fucking relevant yeah. to the story and the main character's history and why they do what they do and blah, 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 blah. Don't. Yeah. If I know absolutely nothing about her by the end of the first book, but you mentioned her a handful of times, fuck off. <laughs> that pissed me off. That's fair. I think I think a lot of people feel the same as you do. It's it's usually a complaint whenever I watch a, yeah. a podcast where they're reading it for the first time. Um, the only thing I can say is the the payoff is worth it. So I find that really hard to believe. <laughs> like I can understand there could be a, like a really great payoff, but like I don't understand what could be so good of a payoff that like I'm not gonna find out anything until book three. I what? It's a really great payoff for like two pages. No. No. That, that's all I'll no, say. It's, it's, not, a, it's a, not a two-page payoff. Will, I'll just say that. I will happily eat my words, Spencer. <laughs> I will gleefully eat my words. But yeah, right now, I, I am just fucking pissed off. Right, right. Okay, I want to know and you gave me nothing. <laughs> that was the weakest tea. What about, uh, what about the Bonds mage? What do you think is going to happen with him? I think he's going to set it up to be Locke's biggest fucking problem very quickly. Um, I don't know how you can run and hide from these type of people. So once again, I think it was like the stupidest fucking thing to leave this guy living. But I don't know what he could have done. Yeah. I, I truly have absolutely no idea what he could have done. I think he made the best out of a situation that he possibly could at the moment to yeah. live to the next moment but i have no idea yeah where this is gonna go how this is gonna go how he could pull this off but i didn't see how he was gonna pull the plot of the first book off and he did so yeah i would be very excited to see how the author does that nice yeah i think i mean he should have just burned the body right so that there's nothing left to find or nothing left to like figure out I think in his world, it was like, all right, I'm not killing him, which is yeah. what they would do. So, like, they should not kill me. But what you did to me was worse. Right. For sure. You took away what he could do. Like, that would be like taking away my hands. Yeah. I'd never be able to speak again. Like, I need right. my hands to speak. <laughs> you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, I can't imagine. But that guy deserved it. He was an asshole. So what's that play? play stupid games win stupid prizes right you know both yeah. of them <laughs> yeah for sure yeah caitlin i i really enjoy theorizing it's it's my favorite part of of reading books um is crafting theories and guessing and stuff uh so i'm with you i'm with you for sure 
I, I don't think I ever got as upset about the Sabbath thing as as Sam is, but everybody's entitled to their uh, to their opinion for sure. So annoyed. <laughs> well, I am so excited for you to read the next book. I there's a part of me that wishes we didn't have Harry Potter scheduled next week, um, and I'm actually still waiting for a response from Bryce, who is going to join us. Um, and if for some reason he can't do it next week, maybe we can, if we find out on Monday, maybe we can quickly shift to reading the second book or something. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited for you to read the second one and especially the third one. It sounds like a lot of the things that you want from the series are going to come from the third book. Oh, uh, it's totally. <laughs> <laughs> but the second book, but here's the thing it's like, the things that you want are going to come from the third book, but the second book is also so good for so completely creative. different reasons. Yeah, yeah. it is yeah. amazing. I'm, I'm going to take it downstairs with me as soon as we get off. Yeah, I, that's what I'm taking downstairs with me because I need to know where this goes next. I'm so excited. <laughs> you should you should text us as you read it and just oh, like I always do. yeah, just kind of kind I of log do. it a I'm little like, bit. I'm like, don't respond, but like I just need to fucking say this. Right, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. So I felt it's about that. I was like, I just need to say this because I, I, I just need to get it out I there. Know where this is going, but I just want to express my complaint. Right, for sure. That's totally fair. Uh, well, thank you so much for hanging out with me for like three hours, uh, including the time yeah. that we we chatted beforehand and three and a half now. Yeah, yeah. It was <laughs> it was a great time. So. Uh, yeah, always love having you on. It's been great to have you on so much this year specifically. Um, and yeah, we're super excited to, uh, to check out the rest of these books with you. So can't wait. So many to come. So many. We have to do, we have to do the, the Gentleman Bastard series. We have to do Iron Flame. And then you have to read King's Dark Tidings because if you liked Lies of Loch Lamora, you're going to love King's Dark Tidings. All right, let me see if I have it already. And then... I'm the same person who owns so many books that I have to like look it up because I may... Uh, wait, Calcade. I actually think I own this. Oh, okay, nice. I own this. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. So I already have the book. Oh, cool. Very cool. I read a different Kelcade book though that I freaking loved. Oh yeah, she has another series that's pretty good too. I would say King Stark Tidings is significantly better. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. So, um, and then we also at some point need to do a Court of Thorns and Roses. That would be funny. So I think with how well the Fourth Wing went, we absolutely need to do a Court of Thorns and Roses because just like the book we just read that's a series where book one is one thing and book two on is a completely different thing. Oh, does it get better what or worse? Happens in, yeah. What happens in book two totally shifts your view on everything. Huh. Um, and it would be really interesting to talk about in, in like but a I funny way or like, does it like shift it in like a, like a insane. Cool I have way. just never read a fantasy romance novel where what happened in book one and then what happens in book two happens. Mm. I'd never had a plot change, twist, but in such a good way. Um, Interesting. Okay. It, it's what really set me off in a way on like this fantasy romance trope I was doing for a while and it's not usually a big thing I do. But I have read A Court of Thorns and Roses probably more times than I've read any other series in no my life. Way, it is really? my go to. If I am in a funk, I pick up any of the books in those series and it gets me back out of my reading funk. Um, I don't know what it is. It's just my go to series. Okay. I'll, I'll have to be careful about tearing it apart then. You can, and I will argue with you about it. I mean, that's that's what we do, right? We do. I'll have Gabe on my side. Yeah. Gabe will agree. Right? Yeah, I'll just be like, it was great. I liked the dragons. <laughs> I was going to say, Gabe, like, I like the dragons. Can we get more? I'm like, book two, book two. Right, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh. All right, guys. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today. Comment below if you have any thoughts on the lies of Locke Lamora or the Gentleman Bastard series as a whole. 
We'd love to chat with you about it down there. Or if you'd like to reach out to us directly, you can do so on our Twitter page or Discord, which are both linked in the description. Uh, also linked down there is our Patreon page where you can get exclusive content as well as watch these episodes live as we record them, uh, like people are doing today. Like Caitlin. Caitlin, <laughs> yeah, she's been commenting on the video and she's been uh, now a part of the episode that you will all see on YouTube. So if you'd like to do the same, definitely check out our Patreon page. Lastly, don't forget about our bingo card. If you fill it out using any of our episodes or videos or live streams from 2024, we will straight up buy you a hardcover trilogy of your choosing. So don't miss out on that. The instructions and everything are linked down in the description. Uh, coming up on the podcast is our next Potter Watch episode, as well as uh, we'll be diving into Stormlight Archive, uh, and that'll be coming out very soon after this Gentleman Bastard series that we have going on here. So hit the subscribe and notifications button to keep up with everything that we have coming out. After all, we just have to keep you subscribed until Jean gets back. Uh, we thank you Please. so very much for hanging out with us today, and until next time, nice bird, asshole. Nice bird, asshole. Hey, you're on speakerphone. Oh, what's up? Hey, uh, any luck? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure we have a service outage right now. Oh, oh. dang. Yeah, because the whole, whole house is down. Everybody can connect to the Wi-Fi, but there's no internet access, so. Ah. Saying modem. But, okay, so, well, we're live right now. Is there anything you want to say about the book real quick? I mean, other than it's like... I don't know. I, I, I had I had some notes that I wrote down. Um, they weren't like anything special, but two things that I think stood out the most right now about this book to me. First of all, is the way that it's written. The you know people talking. The the way that they talk. The things that they say are the some of the most outlandish shit. Like the heard, banter right? and the dialogue and just, stuff. The dialogue is just crazy. Like you'll yeah. There's just a lot of that. Um, and of course, it's written really, really well. It's a cool cool story. I. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm on the spot right now. I don't sure. know what else to say, but it's awesome. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, cool. Well, we will uh, we'll see you next week for Harry Potter. And yeah, um, and then hopefully, we'll... Hopefully soon in the next... Hopefully little soon. Little yeah, little hopefully soon. Okay, sweet. All right. All right, see you later, man. You, man. All right, bye. Bye. And a big shout out to Caitlin. Thank you so much for backing us at the Greenbone Tier. Bye.